Those who proclaim to be able to fit mounts say they're going to fit to the turf you play and the size divot you take. I would ask you this, what's the next wedge lie that you're going to have going to look like? What's the turf under that lie going to be? You don't know. Nobody listening to this podcast knows. It could be on a hard pad. It could be that it rained last night. The fairways are real soft. It could be a bunker that's got foam packed wet sand. It could be a different place in that same bunker that the sand is fluffier. We don't get to play tour level golf courses. We don't get to play the exact same turf week in, week out, the exact same sand. I mean, if you watch the tour players, sometimes they nip the ball with no divot at all. And sometimes they take a beaver felt. Well, that's intentional. But with us, that could be accidental. Hi, this is Joel Gershon from Camarillo, California, and I play at Olivas Lynx Golf Course. This is Golf Smarter number 891. Carrying the right wedge is as important as understanding how to use one with the wedge guy, Terry Kaler. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Terry. It's great to be back, Fred. It's always fun when we get together and have these uh, these exchanges. Well, you know, I I just happened to be going through my spreadsheet today to see. Now, Terry's been on a lot for a long time. When did he start? Which our first time together was uh, in two in June of two thousand eight, episode one hundred twenty nine. Wow. Um, and so which company was that? That would have been Eidolon. Eidolon was the first yeah. one, right? And then this is your 18th appearance. So we've been through, what, three? Eidolon, yeah. Eidolon Score, and, and then Ben Spoker, Hogan. Ben Hogan, and now Edison. Now Edison, and Edison is here to stay. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, intended to be my last uh, my last go around. And okay. everything I've ever wanted to do in wedges, I'm doing it here. So uh, we have a lot of fun. Oh, man, you are such a Texas guy. You're supposed to say this is my last rodeo. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I'll, I'll no, that's okay. Again. That's okay. Uh, the reason I wanted to bring you on is because I got an email from Edison the other day that said that the new Edison 2.0 wedges are now available. And you yeah, kind of tease uh, us. You teased us last time you were on that it was coming and you couldn't talk about it. So I really want to pick your brain today. Okay. Well, I'm an open book, as you know. I do. <laughs> I do. That's why I keep coming back. So I find it fascinating that, uh, you know, especially after going to the PGA show, um, the, so many of the OEMs, the, the manufacturers of golf clubs, they have to come out with new product every six months. They've got to show something different and, you know, and we all know that the restrictions are so tight that to create something new is pretty hard to do. And so they'll come out with a new color, you know, it's like the new iPhone yellow, who cares, right? But, you know, it's like, oh, we have a white driver now. We have a pink driver. Yeah, but what is it going to do for me? But Edison doesn't do that. Edison doesn't announce new clubs every six months. No, we um, we introduced the uh, first generation Edison Forged in uh, April of 2020. Uh, actually, announced them earlier that year and and began actively, you know, manufacturing and selling them in April of 2020. And at that time, you know, I I'm a continuous tinkerer, Fred. I mean, I'm you know that I knew these did everything I wanted them to do, but I was continuing to say, but what if I did this? What if I did that? And I go through a different round there. I'll take golf clubs, I'll weld on them and grind on them and see how they work and discard them or put them over in the aha pile if that is something really is, excuse me, is interesting. But uh, with the Edison Fords, I mean, they're just so, such high performing wedges and we're so different than anything out there. And, and, you know, my performance criteria is how can I make wedges more forgiving without sacrificing the skillful shot making that, you know, everybody um, has some level of skillful shot making they're willing to try. Some people stay very basic. Some people play wedges out of fear. Some people, like we see, you know, at Augusta, you know, some people are absolute magicians with their wedges. These elite players, they do things, you know, you watch them at Augusta. They hit, you know, 
every kind of shot possible within three feet of the hole, and they do it, you know, 20 different ways. And so every golfer has their own comfort level of what they're willing to try to do with their wedges. And I don't want to ever compromise that skilled shot maker uh, with any of my technologies, but most of us and, and your listeners and, you know, the vast majority, you know, we have a wedge out and whether we need to hit it 30 feet or 120 yards, our, our goal is for it to go that far, even if I don't hit it quite right. And um, the distance control is the number one thing that plagues golfers in their wedges. And it's really built into the traditional wedges we've always played. And, you know, you mentioned uh, going back to Eidolon, my first wedge company. And, you know, I've always tried to move weight up higher in the wedge to, to get more mass behind that high face shot, behind that toe shot. Um, you know, with the score line, I've ventured off into a progressive weighting and kind of a accented heel and toe weighting in wedges. It worked extremely well. I get emails and, and calls from golfers weekly. I'm still playing my old score wedges. Is it time for me to change? And I say, yeah, that's 12 year old technology. I've advanced the art in that 12 years. Um, and we're seeing other companies start to do things with wedges. Particularly we're seeing a little more mass up high in the blade of everybody's wedges now. But they're not as they're not even where those old idle on wedges were as far as having thickness up above the center of the golf club. And the Edison Forge wedges we introduced in twenty twenty were twenty five, thirty percent more mass above the above center face impact than anybody out there. And I've moved that even further with the Edison 2.0 wedges, which we have up to 42% more mass above the center strike. And what mass above the center strike does is it gives you vertical forgiveness. You know, on wedges, because of the loft, it's much easier to hit it high in the face than it is with, say, a 7 iron. Um, and so, you know, the, the common misses on wedges are high on the face and out toward the toe. And I examine hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wedges, you know, in golfer's bags, and I look at how the impact pattern is on the face of their golf club. And when I look at a tour player's wedges, that impact pattern is about the size of a dime or a penny, and it's right down on the third and fourth groove. But when I look at your wedges and my wedges, even as a low single digit handicapper, I look at skilled club professionals, I look at rank and file six to 20 handicappers, and that wear pattern is more the size of a silver dollar uh, or a half dollar, and it's much higher in the face in the center, and it, it skews out toward the toe and high face. So a driving force has meant, how do I make that shot turn out better without sacrificing that perfect strike down there on that third or fourth groove? And so with the 2.0, I've continued my, my work to migrate mass around the golf club head, and we refined some sole design. Uh, my Kaler sole, we can talk about that, we have, and we... Uh, changed our shaft offering considerably um, and expanded it so we can do more in the custom world with our golfers. Uh, but it's a it's an evolution, not a revolution. It's a continuation of what I was doing in the Edison Forge um, to push it. I would say in today's market, there's only one wedge that outperforms our original Edison Forge, and that's the new Edison 2.0. The Edison Forge is still the most high-performing wedge out there compared to everything else in the market. But I, you know, I saw that I had created a prototype that even improved upon that performance, and that's what became the Edison 2.0. When did the the first line of Edison uh, get released? Uh, Edison Forge was introduced in April of 2020, three years ago. Three years so ago. So you were okay. talking about six-month product cycles. We had a three-year cycle. So Okay, okay. Yeah, because they're still in my bag. I'm yep. still, I'm still, um, even though I carry a set of ping irons, my wedges, my ping wedges are, are just nice, bright and shiny because yep. they just don't get used. And you taught me very early on that you always considered a nine iron to be a wedge and yet well, people considered them, you know, you know, the, and we were talking about this in a conversation with my golf professional and some golfers the other day. You know, just because you put a P on the bottom of a club doesn't make it a wedge. And if you go back to when the, the I call them the modern greats of the game. You know, if you go back and, you know, I'm a big fan of history from, you know, Hogan, Nelson, Sneed, Demerit, all the way back to Saracen and Jones. And watch how they played the game and what they did. Saracen is 
uh, generally credited with being the father of the modern sand wedge and the modern bunker technique of, of explosion shots and, you know, blasting out of the bunker. But you look at the greats of the, of the 70s and 80s and Watson and Miller and Nicholas and, you know, all of those guys, there were some masterful wedge players, but they pitched the ball with a pitching wedge because their pitching wedge had 51, 52 degrees of loft. And then they carried a sand wedge of 55 or 56. This was before the advent of the, of the lob wedge. And that's what they scored with. Their nine iron was a 46, 47 degree golf club. And, you know, they would bump and run with an eight iron, which was a 44, 45 degree golf club. Well, in the modern sets that we're seeing out there, that 44 or 45 degree golf club has now got a P on the bottom of it. But it doesn't change the dynamics. It's still a 44 or 45 degree golf club. You can not get the loft to hit a true pitch shot with that club. And, you know, that became the advent of the gap wedges and approach wedges and these things. But when you get into the high loft golf clubs, these are very peculiar animals because of all that loft and how the mass is distributed in the back of a 50 or 52 degree golf club to optimize performance is very different than what it is in that 31 or 33 degree seven iron. And yet, you know, you're matching wedges to your iron sets. They look like your seven iron. And you can, can't accurately and consistently pitch the ball with that thin face, super perimeter weighted golf club. It's great in the seven iron, great in the five iron, makes three and four irons even easier to hit, but it doesn't, it doesn't advance the art in wedge play. And I'm just kind of zeroed in on what happens when you're in prime scoring range, whether that starts at 150 yards for you or whether that starts at, you know, 110 yards or 100 yards. When you're in prime scoring range and you have a wedge in your hand, it's all about distance control, consistency of contact, sole versatility. And these are the things that I've just zeroed in on with the Edison wedges, really all of the last 30 years, but, but particularly with the Edison wedges. Fabulous. Uh, we're going to take a time out. We'll be right back. I love that you said the art of wedge play, because I think that so many golfers, when they go out to either practice or warm up and they pull out their wedges, they try to hit a full swing on the wedge. And they don't necessarily try to get four or five different shots out of every club. No, but I think you're exactly the, right. And and yeah. what we've learned and what I'm a big proponent of is a full swing with a driver and a full swing with a seven iron and a full swing with a gap wedge are three different full swings. And a full swing with a wedge to me is about 80 to 85% of what you consider a full swing with the seven or eight iron. And by mm -hmm. doing that, that slower, more deliberate swing, it allows you to keep your lead side, your left side, if you're right-handed. It allows you to keep that lead side ahead of the club through impact, and it produces a, a, a better quality strike, and it produces actually a more penetrating ball flight and, and the same distance you would get out of a, quote, full swing, but the ball's not going to balloon up in the air as readily. You're going to make more consistent contact, and you know with wedges, consistency of contact is how you get distance consistency you know, aside from the design of the golf club head, but I can't, you know, we in the golf club business, we can only control what the golf club itself does. We can't control what the golfer does. And it's the golf, the wedges are the heaviest head in the, in the set. They're, you know, the shortest shaft. There's a lot of little nuances to wedge play. And, you know, when I'm talking your what we would consider full swing distance, again, 80 to 85% of your say your seven iron swing speed and you'll see more controllable trajectories but you know you have two or three or four wedges in your bag you need to learn you know what a, a, an 85 percent swing and a 65 percent swing and a, a half swing will produce and now you have yardage gapping from you know let's say your full swing pitch wedge is 115 yards and you know you need to be able to carve that up into five to eight yard increments all the way down to 20 or 30 yards. And you do that by varying your swing speed, your swing length, and which club you, you use. And one of the things we've learned, and it's peculiar to all wedges, but specifically to the Edison 2.0, is 
in those intermediate wedge shots, you'll get as much or more spin and improved distance consistency by dropping down to your 52 to 54 degree wedge then always reach up for that high lofted wedge because you're inside gap wedge rate. You know, don't automatically reach for that 57 or 58 or 60 degree wedge just because you're only 60 yards. You know, learn that 60 yard shot with your 54 degree wedge or your 53, and you'll find more controllable trajectories. You'll find no loss of spin. In fact, you may gain spin, and you'll find much more consistent impact because that 54 degree wedge is more forgiving than a 58 if you move the impact up and down the face. So a high face shot on a 54 is going to go better than a high face shot on a 58, regardless of the brand. Um, but, you know, the, and I really encourage people, you know, that gap wedge, that 52 to 54 degree wedge, that should be really your go-to wedge unless you need the loft of the 58 or 60. I think that most people... Uh, are surprised that just because they pull out a wedge, they're not going to get spin. S putting spin on a ball is a skill as well. I mean, it takes work. It's not a simple thing to do. No, and and I've written several blogs about you know the dynamics of spin, and spin is a is if we leave the club out of the equation for a minute, spin is a function of club head speed and cleanliness of contact and where on the face you make contact. So everybody knows the old, you know, you hit a shot, you know you caught it a little thin, it's a little bit of a heater, it flies past the flag, but it just sucks up like it was on brakes. And everybody calls it <laughs> thin to win, right? And and that's yeah. because when you made contact thin, I'm not talking about one right in the eyebrows, I'm talking about that, ooh, I caught that a little thin. You had almost all of the mass of the golf club head was above that point of impact. And that creates what's called gear effect, and it enhances the spin. That's why the door players spin the ball so much, because they know how to nip that ball on the second, third, fourth groove. And that's how they get all that spin, because they're hitting it right down on that second, third, or fourth groove, and they're optimizing the gear effect of that golf club. What we did with the Edison wedges is put so much mass up in the top part of the golf club, we're optimizing spin up higher in the club at the fourth, fifth, or sixth groove. We're giving you the same kind of spin that other wedges, you would have to hit it on that second or third groove to get that spin. And it's a it's a fundamental of golf club performance called gear effect. And it, it works horizontally on the golf club. You hit the ball out on the toe, it tends to take a draw spin back. If you hit it low in the heel, it tends to take a fade spin uh, back to the center. That's horizontal gear effect. But that gear effect works uh, the same way vertically. So if you look at the the guys on the tour that are always out there to get high launch with low spin with their drivers, they're hitting the ball above the center of the face with that driver. The, the, the optimum performance spot with modern drivers is above center face, and it gets more of the mass of that driver below the point of impact so the ball wants to launch high with, with minimal spin. And in a wedge, you're looking for a penetrating trajectory with lots of spin, but that wedge has all the weight on the bottom, so it, you have to hit it right down on that second, third, fourth groove with a traditional wedge in order to optimize spin. Well, that's you know a fraction from a pure blade of that ball. And you know we don't play the tight fairways they play. We play the ball where it's fluffier fairways, and we catch. We might even roll it. We hit more shots out of the, out of the rough. So we amateur golfers, we by just by nature of the playing conditions. We hit the ball higher in the wedge face than the tour players did because of the, we're playing fluffier fairways. The ball's sitting up higher, and so we can't. Um, and let me just throw this in. Uh, you are known as the wedge guy, and you've been writing blogs for a long time. Are you still writing blogs for GolfWorks? I'm writing for GolfWRX.com, yes, every week. I think I'm up to, we're talking about how many shows you've done. And how many I've done. Uh, last count, I've got over a thousand articles published uh, as the wedge wow. guy over the last 20 years. Oh, that's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you for doing that too. And everyone should look him up for that. Let's talk about the grooves for a second, because I remember at one point uh, the rulings on what grooves can offer, what the grooves have, that changed. 
And there was a lot of concern in the, not only on the professional level of what, how the impact was going to be, but also a lot of concern from the manufacturers of how is this going to impact their inventory and the future of their clubs? Well, it really amazes me of so many manufacturers in the wedge category are still trying to make a big deal out of grooves. And I take <laughs> offense to that because the rules of what we can do to grooves haven't changed since 2010. Um, and prior right. to 2010, we started machine cutting grooves and idle on wedges were the first production wedges to offer the full CNC machine grooves. And we could cut those with super sharp square edges and they would shred golf balls, if you remember, and they would just spin the ball like crazy. Um, a lot of tour players actually back then would, would wear down their grooves because they spun the ball too much for a tour player skill level. Um, the USDA changed the rules in 2010, and they said, we have to put a, a radius on the edge of that groove. And it changed the way we had to make grooves because this rule was very different than before. So we had to manage this radius on the edge of the groove. Well, we're getting into, you know, hundreds of thousands of an inch, um, Fred, that we're, we're talking about machining. And when we did that, the, the spin off the golf club relaxed a little bit because that groove edge was not so sharp. But, but the tour guys actually liked it because they know how to spin the ball a varying amount. I mean, you watch them at Augusta this last week, and they're hitting a sand wedge. They're kind of bumping, run, and letting it release. They're hitting another wedge that's a one-hop and stop. You know, they hit those amazing wedge shots, skip like three times, and then it stopped. They know how to do this because they spend thousands of hours learning how to do this with their wedges, hitting all different kinds of shots. And the rest of us are just trying to make the ball do something acceptable. But the USDA has not changed the rules on grooves since 2010. The only thing that's changed is machining techniques and tolerances have gotten incrementally better so that we can hold that tolerance tighter than we could say, in the days of score wedges. We couldn't hold those tolerances as tight as we can now. But for a manufacturer to say they created a groove that gives 15% more spin, I'm, i got to call BS on that, or if you're Texas thing for you. <laughs> but, you know, because you can't do that. We, we tested with an Edison wedge with a full smooth face versus, you know, our production grooves that are pushed right to the limit of the USGA. And on a dry golf ball, mind you, the, the club with no grooves at all only lost 15% spin. That's from no grooves at all to the production groove. Mm. So for somebody wow. to say they can add 15% spin by, you know, cutting their groove an extra, you know, nine, ten thousandths of an inch sharper, you can't make it sharper. The USDA says it has to have a radius on the edge, and that radius is measured that ten thousandths of an inch, and you can't make them sharper than that. So I really take offense to people trying to make a story where there isn't one. Your wedge has to have grooves on it, and the grooves are there to channel away moisture and grass to get more of the face, of, just like the tread on your tire. The grooves on your golf club are designed to channel away moisture and grass so that you can get adhesion to the space between the grooves and get friction. So if you think about you know, your tires, for people that operate in really horrible conditions, they put big blood and mud grips on their car, or their truck, or their Jeep. If the dragsters that are running a complete, on the Formula One, when they're running a dry track, they run totally slick tires because it's a dry track. They want maximum friction, maximum adhesion. But if it starts raining on the Formula One or NASCAR, they got to go into the pit and get different tires on. They, now they got to have tread to channel away that moisture. And grooves really... That's the purpose they serve, is to channel away matter. And there's only so much we can do. And the USGA says you can do this. And every quality manufacturer pushes that USGA limit right to the limit because we can with modern milling techniques. And when you go out and find wedges that are super cheap, you know, and they're all price points out there, they're probably, not, they can't be milling those wedges to nth degree tolerances, those grooves rather, because the price point won't allow it. Milling is an expensive one-at-a-time process to get these grooves in the face to the ultimate, uh, you know, the ultimate measurement. 
That's an, a phenomenal explanation. I really appreciate it. We're going to take another time out. We'll be right back. You mentioned that you're a tinkerer. Now, I'm fascinated about that. Is it that you are sitting there with uh, uh, with these wedges in your hand and 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 the, your power tools and stuff, or do you have people you say, "All right, try this, try this, try this"? A little bit. Uh, where did that fit? Okay. If I'm doing something evolutionary, I'll typically work with our foundry that that forges our heads and finishes our heads for us. And tremendous quality. I've used them since the old score days. Um, they have a great tool room and, and they can offer me some really quick turnaround on things. And I'll say, Hey, let's, I might send them a sketch. I might send them a model that I've made up with putty and clay and whatever. I might just, you know, send them an email of here's what I'm thinking. Uh, but other times I'll take wedges and I'll go to a local machine shop that I have a relationship with and. I'll say, we're going to cut some material out here. We're going to weld some material in there. And then I'm going to go grind on that wedge and um, and get it where we want it. So it's a combination. Uh, golf clubs actually are not the only thing I tinker with. I'm tinkering with fishing rods and shotguns and my outboard motor on my bait. <laughs> all other kind of things all the time, too. So I just, I can't get over tinkering. I was that little kid that, you know, worked at my dad's elbow with, you know, taking fishing reels apart when we were back from our saltwater trips and putting them. I was always the kid that liked to know how things work. You know, I take the things apart, see if I can put them back together and not have any parts flipped over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was that guy too. It was my brother always broke stuff and walked away and he's like, "What'd you do?" <laughs> I'm like, "No, no, wait. What did I do? Uh, I'll fix it. Don't worry. I'll t I'll put it back yeah. together." <laughs> <laughs> um, can can we talk about um, bounce for a while? We've been hearing a lot of conversation about bounce, and and again, this conversation is for the amateur golfer, the recreational golfer who doesn't really understand the nuances of the various clubs, other than this is a forty degree, and this is forty five, and this is oh, you mean I'm supposed to have four degrees in between each of these clubs? Oh, I didn't know that, you know. So, and I think bounce is a really important element, and you've messed with, you've played with, you've perfected bounce, um, and and incorporated it into your clubs over the years. And I think you have great explanation for that. Well, you know, the bottom of a club has to have bounce. And, and that's the downward angle of the sole to keep the club from digging in the turf, to keep it from being a shovel, okay? So every club has to have some kind of bounce to it. You know, even your middle and long irons, they have some bounce built in, but it's very mild because the angle of attack is shallow. Wedges have more bounce because you're working through a variety of shots around the greens, bunkers to tight turf. And I've always taken offense to this claim or notion that you can fit bounce. I mean, if I'm John Rom or, you know, Scotty Scheffler and have that level of skill, I can feel things in a golf club that we can hardly measure. And they can feel certain things. But I will tell you that at the Masters this week, the wedges they played on Thursday were not the same wedges they were playing after the rains came because Augusta got softer. These guys, they get to go to the tour trailer whether it's Callaway, Titus, whatever, and get a bunch of free new wedges. I need more bounce. The course just got wet overnight. I need more bounce. By the time they got to Sunday, they may have gone back to their other wedges. That course drains pretty well, and the ground got a little sounder again, and they might have gone to different bounces. And they do that through the course of the season because they can feel things that we can't feel, and they, they know how to execute a jillion different golf shots. But, but my... My challenge to the notion of bounce fitting is that those who proclaim to be able to fit bounce say they're going to fit to the turf you play and the size divot you take. I would ask you this. What's the next wedge lie that you're going to have going to look like? What's the turf under that lie going to be? You don't know. Nobody listening to this podcast knows. It could be on a hard pad. It could be that it rained last night. The fairways are real soft. It could be a bunker that's got firm packed wet sand. It could be a bunker on, or a different place in that same bunker that the sand is fluffier. We don't get to play tour level golf courses. We don't get to play the exact same turf week in, week out, the exact same sand. And we take 
I mean, if you watch the tour players, sometimes they nip the ball with no divot at all, and sometimes they take a beaver cut. Well, that's intentional, but with us, that could be accidental, you know. So Wait, if you a don't beaver take cut? the same What's that? A, you said a beaver cut? So Is that what you said? Pelt. We take a... Beaver pelt, a big old giant divot. You see them when they play. Oh, you know? okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm like, I never heard that so, one before. Okay, I got so you. So my point is, if you don't know, if you don't pick the exact same divot every time, which we amateurs do not, and you don't no. play the exact same turf every time, which nobody does, then there's no way to <laughs> fit bounce to this wide variety of things. So, you know, I've been uh, in my, my entry into the wedge business started in in the early '90s when I created the soul. So, well, high bounce is good sometime, and a low bounce is good sometime. Why don't I just put both of them on every wedge I make? So the Edison wedges and all my wedges prior have had a very high bounce in the first quarter to a third of an inch of the sole and a, and a low bounce in the back part of the sole. So these two angles are always working together. So it doesn't really matter what kind of lie you have. Just hit the shot. I don't want you to have to think about whether you have the right bounce or not. This club is going to come out of the turf, but it's not going to skip if it's in a tight lie. And it, it, it's just the smartest, most versatile soul in the entire wedge category. And, and I will agree, the big brands that offer these myriad of bounce angles, they have a bounce for every possible shot and divot. Unfortunately, you only can carry three or four wedges, and, and they have to have a bounce that works to a wide variety of conditions. Because we buy our wedges. We put five, six, seven hundred dollars worth of wedges in our bag, and they need to work how many golf courses I'm going to play till I wear these wedges out? How many different shots am I going to face? And the the Kaler sole is designed to give you the maximum amount of versatility. And we coined the term fear no shot. You are never going to walk into a shot that you have the wrong bounce for. And that's really what it's about. And uh, mm. we have people raving about them since back in the Eidolon, even before that, the Reed Lockhart days, and people raving about this dual bounce v soul it's been known by a number of trademarks through my other companies that i've designed for but so i finally said hey it's my soul i'm just going to put kaler soul on it so uh i patented that soul in 19 uh the patent was awarded in 1994 and a lot of tour players i don't know where they learned it, if they found some of my wedges but last year it was published that the greatest player of the modern era that he, they were showing his wedges which is company actually has a grind that oh, off of his initials we will mention that and i've had people say well your your grind is kind of a copy of that I say really because my grind was patented when that guy was 13 years old so i don't think that my grind is a copy <laughs> of what he's learned to do with his wedges so um <laughs> but uh but i did receive a patent on the notion of putting two positive bounce angles in the sole that patent's expired some other companies are playing around with it but they don't have 30 years experience with that soul that I have. And I'm continually refining and tweaking how those two angles are always working together to give you the ultimate versatility. So how much tweaking did you do between ver you know, your version one of Edison and version two? Um, what are the major changes between the two that we would notice? The major changes in the appearance of the back of the golf club, which looks very different, but it's because I reallocated, depending on the law, 14 to 17 grams of mass from lower in the club head to higher in the club head. So it, it continued to enhance our forgiveness, continue to shrink our, our dispersion patterns, continue to, to help you get a more penetrating trajectory. I tweaked a little bit on, on some of the sole bounce angles that's very minor. The main difference in the golf club is in the back detail, which how I manage the mass of the golf club. And when you look at the back of this golf club, you'll actually realize if you kind of put your fingers, you know, on the face of the club and your thumb in the back of the club, you can feel this club actually gets thicker from center face out toward the toe, from center face toward the heel. I'm actually putting a bit more mass behind your miss hit. Um, and not out to the far perimeter of the golf club, but behind actually where you miss hit it. And, you know, this thing called smash factor, I use this term a lot because it's a basic uh, basic term that we use in golf club is how efficiently club hit speed converted to ball speed. 
So when drivers were looking for smash factors in the 1.45 to 1.52 is about as high as anybody's gotten, which means ball speed is, you know, 50% more than club head speed. When you get down into wedges, that smash factor is on a perfect strike is 18% gain of ball speed. But when you miss that sweet spot by half an inch, it can go down by 15, 16, 18% just because you missed the sweet spot a half an inch. So what I'm kind of the example I give, but if you look at every wedge, that ball that's hit high in the face, there's no mass up there behind that golf ball. There's the, the mass is now all below the golf ball. And, and I've used this analogy a long time, Fred. I don't know if I ever shared it with you, but perimeter weighting has its has its reason for being it has its purpose but i think you perimeter weight the impact area not the entire golf club so i'll use a a standard regular old claw hammer that carpenters have been using for 300 years and when you drive a nail with a hammer it is very efficient at driving that nail which is why nobody's made other than the pneumatic nail gun nobody's ever made a huge improvement on a claw hammer right i mean they were pretty much perfected this technology (laughs) But if you take that same hammer and you turn it on its side and you try to drive the nail where the handle goes into that hammer and it's very thin there, it doesn't drive a nail worth a darn. It's the same hammer, it's the same weight, it's the same you swinging it, but you're hitting the nail now where all the mass is away from that point of impact and it's not very efficient. You've lost your smash factor. And that, to me, is one of the best explanations of Smash Factor. If we could all hit the ball in exactly the same spot every time, then we would play golf with a golf club that looked like a hammer because all the mass would be directly behind the point of impact. But we have to make the face bigger because we wouldn't want to swing a golf club with a face the size of a quarter. You know, golf would be impossible. So we make the golf club hit, but, but, and we still have some mass when we make that miss hit. When we go to a full perimeter weighted golf club, all the mass is at the far perimeter. So we have a weird smash factor around the center of the face. But, you know, in a muscle back blade, it's kind of the opposite. More mass is right behind that center hip because that that elite player that likes a muscle back blade, he wants that mass behind the miss hit because, I mean, behind the center face because he hits it there most of the time. So... I think the analogy of the hammer, and people can really relate to the fact everybody's turned a hammer on its side and tried to drive a nail that doesn't drive a nail worth a darn because you've lost your smash factor because there's no mass right behind the impact. Hmm. All right, let's take another time out. We'll be right back. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans is kind of like being on the 17th tee box as we only have two episodes left in our annual Tony Manzoni series, to help you launch your new golf season. This episode addresses the difference between men and women on the golf course. Tony says that the disparity isn't ability, it's just distance. He also talks about taking advantage, not being intimidated by your nerves. We all get nervous, we all get anxious, and that never goes away and hopefully never will because adrenaline is a good thing if you use it properly. But if you set up to the ball properly, whether you're hitting the ball, chipping the ball, whatever, Now your body dictates the distance the ball is going to go by its rotation and and tempo. You can fine-tune this thing really quick opposed to trying to time your hands when they turn over, how fast they turn over, and so forth. And those are the things that the modern swing, even though this is not really a modern swing, but it's a modern way of teaching. You watch the tour now. You look at the guys when they step to the ball. You don't see anybody way behind the ball in a dress anymore. There was a guy by the name of Jerry Hogan that said, I want you to stand above the ball, but not behind it. And that's a great statement. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode 207, the penultimate episode in our series featuring our friend and mentor, Tony Manzoni. Check the show notes to learn how to get Tony's book, The Lost Fundamental, One Simple Move, Better Golf Forever, and to gain access to his video of the same name. Please subscribe for free to both of our golf podcasts, Golf Smarter is published every Tuesday since 2005. And our sister podcast that revisits the best of the Golf Smarter podcast called Golf Smarter Mulligans, being released every Friday from wherever you're listening right now. Terry, there were two things when I went to the PGA show this year that I noticed. Um, One of them is it's 
these manufacturers spend a fortune on being uh, having space, whether it's a small space or an enormous space, it costs them a lot of money. Um, the other thing I noticed is that Edison wasn't there. Why do you not see a need for you to have your clubs on display at the retail show of the year for golf? Well, first of all, you understand that's a wholesale show. So you're of uh, the golf professionals and, it all, right. and the major chains and everything. And, and we have been selling direct to consumer. I like custom building golf clubs for the, for the golfer that's going to play them. And we've done that direct to consumer. But I don't consider us a direct to consumer brand by any means. We're getting a lot of inquiries from the fitting community, the independent fitters, the, the chain fitters, club champion, true spec, those guys. And we're working on programs for them. Uh, but to your point, when you go to that golf show, you know, how many people were there with the small booth that you never saw? Because there's just so much there. I mean, it's such a massive environment. And, you know, the big top five brands will spend anywhere from a million and a half to three to four million dollars to be there four days. Um, and, you know, when you're a billion or two billion dollar company, that's not a big deal. Um, and then they have this giant presence where, you know, all the big brands, you couldn't miss them, right? I mean, they were all there. And if you went in, to the apparel section, all the big brands, you couldn't miss them. But you probably walked by a little dumbfounded. You walked by dozens and dozens and dozens of 10 and 20 and 30 foot exhibit booths that you didn't even notice they were there. But yet those small companies still made a, a sizable investment to be there by the time you rent your space and take your exhibit there and bring three or four or five, eight people. Um, it, it's a very big expenditure uh, and, and I've been there as an exhibitor and had great success. I've been there as an exhibitor and wondered why I did that. Um, hmm. But, you know, I mean, it's really a matter of economics. And, and we're a young company and we're growing very methodically and rapidly, doubling every year to six months. Um, and we can manage that. But um, we're, we really haven't got our program where I want it to take it to golf professionals and and, and fitting studios yet. And with that said, we have some independent fitters around the world that are fitting our golf clubs and doing a very good job of it. And, uh, and we support those guys with a good component program. Right. Okay. You're right. Wholesale right. show, not retail, but all the retailers are there attending the show to see what yeah. they I mean, all the big buyers wholesale. are there and, and they're yeah. having their meetings yeah. and yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I got an email this morning from a listener who said, I listened to your episodes about when you went to the PGA show and there was this one uh, product that you talked about that I'm really fascinated, but I can't find them anywhere online. It's like, yeah, I have a feeling they didn't get any funding because that was a very quiet booth and they were just trying to get themselves out there enough to see if they can get some money behind it, but it may not have worked out. So. Well, there's it a happens. lot of people that go to the show hoping for a miracle and, you know, it's like, hey, I've got a new golf company. I have to go to the show. And, you know, the, the wholesale world in golf, and I've been in this business 40 years, but, you know, and, and I kind of say this tongue in cheek, but the vast majority of golf stuff is purchased at the big retail stores, you know, Golf Galaxy, Dick's, PGA Tour Superstore. And while most of the equipment is purchased there, very little of it is actually sold there. Meaning that mm. it's up to me to to get people interested in Edison golf and to get them interested in Edison wedges and educate them about Edison wedges. And I'm not going to be able to go into the retail world and and get thousands of retail floor salespeople familiar with what we do and why. And the big companies... They don't incent their salesmen to sell you one thing over another. Their floor people are there to take care of you. Hey, I'm looking for the new Callaway driver. They're right over here, sir. Have you hit one of these? Let me have. He is not going to say, oh, yeah, but you ought to try the TaylorMade. That's not their job. Their job is to take right. you what you came for. Hi, can I help you today? Yeah, I need some golf balls. What kind do you want? I got them right over here. I'm by this guy. Okay, they're right here. He's not going to say, but have you tried the the Bridgestone, or if you tried the Callaway, that, that's not their job. Their job is to facilitate your shopping experience. And um, so, you know, my thought is if, if, if we have to do all the selling anyway, 
then let's go ahead and consummate that transaction and have a one-on-one relationship. We talk to probably 40% of our customers actually have a conversation with us before they buy wedges. And 60% of them, they'll go in and buy on their own. But, uh, you know, we want to make sure you get the right Edison wedges in your bag, the right lofts, the right shaft. You talked about, you know, some other changes of the Edison 2.0. We've got a whole new assortment of, of KBS shaft standard. We've broadened our shaft offering. We've broadened our grip offering. Um, you know, we're continuing to broaden that. You know, we are the premium custom wedge company, and that's what we want to be. We're building the most high-performance wedge heads in the business, but we want to turn those into high-performance wedges by making sure we get the right loss, the right shaft, the right grip, the right specification. You know, we, we want people to have Edison wedges in their bag that are built just for them, and and we love interacting with, with our customers to make sure we get those just right. Right, right. So for a golfer who plays uh, weekly, okay, or maybe twice a week, uh, same kind of golfer, how long should a wedge last? Because, I mean, you're definitely going to be hitting your wedges a whole lot more than you're hitting your driver or your three wood, right? Or your five iron. Your wedges are going to get played almost every hole. Yeah, and, and, you know, there's one major brand that says your wedges need to be replaced after 60 to 70 rounds, and I I find that to be economically not viable for the average golfer. Yeah. But the tour, yeah. Guys, the tour guys change their wedges out very frequently because they don't have to pay for them. I mean, they're going to, and, and their livelihoods depend on it, even if they did have to buy them, get them kind of money they're, they're playing for to put a, a new five or $600 set of wedges in the bag every month is not cost prohibitive for them, but it is for us, you know, that are playing golf for, for recreation. And, you know, that six or seven, $800 set of wedges is, is an investment. I need to get several years out of those. We, we have had, I mean, I've, I, I've had Edison wedges in my bag. I've got my, uh, 49 degree has been in my bag since the first ones since 20 the the first samples came in the fall of 2019 i hit that golf club a lot i'm not seeing any loss of spin uh the chrome we use is very durable uh the edison 2.0s have a new what we call pearl chrome that has a little more slickness to it to channel away moisture a little faster it's something new in in chrome plating all of these are incremental and minuscule um but if you look at the face of your wedge, and you can look at it with a simple, like a little loop or a magnifying glass, and if the if the edges of the groove are not worn through and, and rusting, you really haven't lost any spin off that golf club. And, and with the Edison's, you know, our, our club head was engineered for spin, um, and so, you know, the grooves just don't wear that fast. Modern golf balls are soft. You know, your sand wedge, if you hit... A lot of bunker shots. I actually had a guy tell me, ask me if, if this wear was normal. He was one of our first Edison customers, and he had literally worn the chrome off of the sole of the golf club. He hit so many golf balls, and and I'm and I mean it was totally worn off down to the bare metal. And I said, you know, I want that for my collection. I'm gonna send you a new. A, I'll re- <laughs> put a new head on that wedge for you because that's, I've never seen one like that before. And and I thought I played a lot of golf and hit a lot of balls. I've never even come close to wearing the chrome off the bottom. So. My hat's off to that guy. He has enough time to hit that many golf balls. Unless he hits them all off a card <laughs> path or something. I don't know how he did yeah, it. Well, well, you know, I, I did actually, uh, as you mentioned, I did notice on my uh, my Edison 57 degree that it's got some damage to the face. I mean, there's some pits in it. There's some, you know, it's like rocks got done. So well, you get bag wear. I mean, gonna... these are forged heads. They're soft. Right. You're going to get bag wear. No, you know, I mean, in a perfect world, people would keep, you know, a cover on their wedges and their arms and, you know, to keep them pristine. Golfers don't do that. Mm. I mean, you kind of. No, you, no, no, no. I mean, not if they want to, probably, they don't want to be made fun of. <laughs> put covers on their arms. And I see very few people with covers on their arms. Just never been done. But yet there's a real argument for it. You know, the cover on your wood is to keep it looking on your drivers, to keep it looking pretty. But it doesn't really. But it doesn't really have any effect on the playability but if you kept covers on your wedges that would affect playability i mean it would keep your faces mm. you know from getting bag wear then you know you you throw that wedge down in the bag it's the shortest clubs so and we can bang off of every iron theoretically on its way to the bottom of the bag you know and and the face is pointed up so it's hitting the 
the top of your other irons on the way into the bag. And so, you know, that's bang in the face. I mean, I see that. I don't think that affects playability. Um, I mean, mine are pretty battered up too, but, you know, and I've got a whole shop full of them. I could go put new ones in my bag anytime I want, but I don't, I don't see the need to do that. Um, yeah. You know, but again, I'm not yeah. playing for three or four million dollars every week either. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. It's bagware. It's got to be the, the, just the irons banging into one another. And, you know, some people yeah. don't even know how to load their bag with the clubs and, you know, so that it, they could take advantage of the, the faces of the clubs not getting damaged. They don't realize that like, yeah. there's an actual protocol of how to load your bag. Yeah. You know, and golfers, I mean, I see golfers with bags full of thousands of dollars worth of golf clubs and no head covers on the woods and, you know, banging them around. And, you know, I mean, everybody their own. I see some that put, put covers on their irons. But I think, you know, we all take care of our golf clubs, our, our automobiles, our, you know, polish our shoes, do whatever. I mean, we all have a different set of standards for how we take care of our things. And, um, you know, I've always thought if there, if there was a way to come up with a really cool cover, protective cover for a wedge that people would actually use, um, that wouldn't look goofy. I think there's that big stigma about if I put covers on my arms, everybody's going to think I'm a nerd, but you know, right. but it's, it's not fun. You don't see the, the tour players don't do it and they're making a living with yeah. these, these clubs. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. But again, they get no, I actually played, they want. I actually played with a guy who carried his bag when he played. He walked, he carried, and he loved the sound of the be- clubs banging up against each other. And I'm like, I can't. Well, I'm an old take that. I, 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 miss the, I miss the sound. Of, I miss the sound of metal spikes on the cart path coming out of the locker room. That you know, <laughs> Hell, going I bet to the you first do. team, the rate. <laughs> to get your game face on with those metal speakers. I miss the sound of metal spikes on concrete. We don't have that anymore. No, no, you'd only do, you only get that on TV when they're when they finish around and the it, cameras it, are following the guys. But it sure has made the locker room carpet last a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it has. Tell me about um, wedge fit and how that works for the consumer when they want to go to uh, when they go to edison.com and are interested in buying some some wedges uh, a wedge or a set of wedges you have a program called wedge fit that is uh, you know a, a great feature to have for anybody who wants to buy directly from the manufacturer you know my approach to wedge fit and this is like the fifth or sixth iteration of, of wedge fit since I created this back 20 years ago. And we call it the wedge fit scoring range analysis. And what we're taking you through is a little bit of a of a questionnaire and interaction and conversation, if you will, about your scoring. You know, how's your set makeup done? What kind of irons you playing? What kind of shafts you playing? What's your you know average distance with the nine iron? What's comfortable? You know, what lofts of wedges are you used to? You know, and and we're trying to get a a little picture of the landscape in your golf bag and your golf game, so that we can make a set of recommendations that you know. Based on what you've told us, you know, we're going to offer some suggestions about here's what four degree gapping would look like for you. Here's what five degree gapping should look like. Here's a recommended shaft. If you've been custom fitted for irons, we recommend you carry those specs to your wedges. You know, if you're a half inch long and two degrees flat, you know, whatever, uh, if you like your grips built up. So what we're trying to do is create a conversation with you to help us put the right Edison's in your bag. Um, and, and it's, if you look at everybody else in the wedge category, they're asking you what you want. And I'm trying to find out what is it that we can help you figure out what you need. And that's really our difference. I'm not asking you to go through and pick what you want. I'm asking you to exchange some information with us so our team can make a recommendation. And so you go through wedge fit, takes three or four minutes. We're going to spit out kind of a, an immediate feedback based on your answers. This is kind of where we think your recommendations, but one of our wedge fit team is going to look at your answers and we're going to send you back an email in a couple of days after we've had a chance to look at some of the, of the, the more subjective data about, you know, what's your ball flight like? What is your, you know, your average distance? And that takes a set of human eyeballs to look at it. I, I don't think you can get the right wedges just by going in and picking them. You know, what kind of shaft should I have in my wedges? What kind of grip should I have on my wedges? And, you know, we're all, I mean, we talk to every customer if, if they want us to. I mean, we really want to make sure we get the right Edison's in your bag. And we, 
you know, we go to great pains to design a great wedge, to craft great wedges, but they're still only going to be as good as the feedback we get. And, and which is why we offer 100% risk-free trial. There's no premium golf club company out here, but we'll build you to let you see what we're all about. We'll build you an Edison wedge of your choice. Pick your loft, pick your shaft. We'll build it, you know, to the length of the life specs you want. We'll build up your grip. Just, we want the right wedge in your bag and go play it for three or four or five rounds. And what you're going to see 99 times out of 100, you're going to see better trajectories, maybe a little more distance, visibly more spin. And you're going to find, most importantly, that you found yourself getting away with some shots going, ooh, I hit that high in the face. Like, oh, wow, it cleared that bunker. I know when I usually hit it high in the face here, it plugs in that bunker or in that water hole. Or it, it doesn't get to the top shelf of the green or whatever. And that's where the Edison wedge was specifically designed to outperform every other wedge is to make your not-so-good shots more like your best ones. And if you hit it perfect, you can play any wedge you want to play. I'll be the first to admit it. If you hit every wedge shot right down on the third or fourth groove with proper shaft lean and, and then pretty much all wedges, including ours, are about the same there. But those shots that venture a little away from perfect, those are the ones we're working on making them very acceptable. And all of your shots, I think you're going to see more visible spin, particularly on those mid-range wedge shots where you don't have the club head speed. Those 30 to 70 yarders, that's where you know people continue to be amazed at the kind of spin they get on those intermediate shots. Phenomenal. Uh, again, edisonwedges.com and check uh, Terry's, his blog, his, his writing at golfwrx.com. Terry, it's always so much fun to talk to you. It's always such a fascinating lesson in, in a part of the game that needs more explanation for every golfer. Really appreciate it, buddy. Well, I always enjoy coming on and sharing. I've spent you know, a lifetime in the game and 40 years in the industry, and I love sharing what I've learned with people. If it can help people hit better golf shots more often, that's what we're all out here for. And, uh, you know, that's everybody that played in Augusta this last week. That's what they all wanted to do is hit better golf shots more often. And if we're out there trying to break 100, that's what we want to do is hit better golf shots more often. And, and you know, my focus is on the short end of the set of helping you do that. So, well, we love doing it. Love coming on your show. Uh, we'll do it again soon, I'm sure. So recently I received an email from a listener commenting on how much they enjoyed the podcast, but asking, how do I avoid information overload? I wish I had an answer for that because so far this golf season, I am so into my head that I cannot score to save my life. I've talked way too much about how the cold and wet weather we've experienced here in Northern California this winter, which has prevented me from playing as much golf as I'm accustomed to. As my golf season pretty much ended in late November, and here we are now in late April, I ended the year with my index down to the lowest point ever. So now, after months of not practicing or playing, I'm struggling not only to make quality golf shots, I'm also making poor decisions on the course, which are leading to an uncomfortable amount of double and triple bogeys on my scorecard. This past weekend was so bad that I seriously questioned whether or not I'm truly enjoying myself on the course right now. And maybe it's time to take up a new hobby. But I also understand the cyclical nature of the game and know that by the time summer rolls around, I will have presented a number of guests on the podcast who will put me in a better frame of mind and should be feeling more comfortable. At least I better be, or you will have one seriously cranky podcast host on your hands. Also, now that spring is blooming around us, I'm going to reach out to many of my local Golf Smarter ambassadors who I've promised to play with this year. So stay tuned to hear more about that. And speaking of ambassadors, I want to give a shout out to Joel Gershon of Camarillo, California for opening up today's episode. As our newest Golf Smarter ambassador, Joel took advantage of this opportunity by selecting Tony Manzoni's video of the Lost Fundamental for his reward. You, too, are invited to join our exclusive global community of golf smarters by introducing... Yeah, I didn't say golf smarters. I said golf smarters. 
Yeah. By introducing an upcoming episode. Now, if you do, you get a choice of prizes that include Tony's video or a box of X1 balls with the Golf Smarter logo from Odin Golf, the golf brand that sponsors and pays everyday players. These tour quality balls are a fraction of the price that you usually pay. And when you use the code GOLFSMARTER at checkout, you'll receive an additional 20% off your order. Their link is in today's show notes. And the third prize you can also receive would be a glove and glove storage compartment from RedRoosterGolf.com, the unique glove subscription service that offers many styles of gloves in 26 sizes for both men and women. So please send an email and I'll get back to you with some instructions of what to do and what to say. Just write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or visit golfsmarter.com and click on the Hey Fred button. And please follow at Golf Smarter on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, or Fred Green, that's green with an E on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions how to get me out of this hole for an upcoming episode, please click on the Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com.